Hello, welcome back to RC Video Reviews. Today we're doing a build review on the Tower Hobbies Uproar V2. I had a little bit of a marathon build day today and got the uproar finished, except for the canopy. And the reason I don't have the canopy on is because if you remember during the unbox, I pointed out there were a couple little flaws. So I have an idea on how to take care of that. And I think what I'm gonna do is spray the interior of the canopy with Plasti Dip. So I don't wanna rush through that, I'm gonna take my time, but the plane's ready to go aside from the canopy. And I don't have the spinner yet. I have the stock spinner that came with the plane, but as you know, I hate those things, so I'll just go without the spinner until I get my aluminum backplate spinner, which should be here sometime this week. Okay, so I ended up recording pretty much the entire build. I think I probably have about eight or nine hours of footage, and I'm gonna tell you that's a real tough thing to do to put an airplane together and film it. So I have a lot of respect for the channels where the guys do that, because it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of material. And to go through it all and edit it all, it's not so much the filming that's the problem, it's the editing. When you have hours and hours of material, it takes a very long time to piece that together. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of the build, and then I'll do some voiceover on some of the highlights of the build itself or the assembly itself. So with that in mind, let's just jump right into it. So here are a couple of 3D parts that I made. I made the air scoop up front to pull air in because there's no other inlet for air. So I made this thing and the way that works, I'll just pull this off and show you, is that I took the battery cover and I just put a little slit there and I made a 3D part that slots onto the front of the battery door. And then you can see in there, there's an opening underneath and, and then I fixed it with a screw and nut. So. There's my air intake now. So I've got a little bit of an air intake. And then on the bottom of the plane to let air out, I opened up these holes on the servo access compartment. That's how I managed airflow. And then the servos, I made these servo trays for the ailerons. So the servos just sit on these trays and the, trays are, the tray is screwed in on the bottom to the hard plate and then on the front to the hard plate. So they're just little adapters to help get standard mini servos to fit that proprietary opening that they use for those tactic servos. And I will make those 3D parts available on Thingiverse. So go look on Thingiverse if you need the servo adapters for a Tower Hobbies Uproar and you want to use Emacs or any other 17 or 25 gram servo with the same dimensions as the Emacs 3003. Okay, let's get into the problem areas and then we'll finish off with the things that I liked about this plane. To begin with, if you remember watching the build video where I talked about the seam between the fuselage and the wing, this one's pretty good, but it's not great. So you can, you can definitely see there is a gap. You see that light coming through there? There's a gap. And this is what I'm talking about. That's as hard pressed against the fuselage as I can make the wing without cracking balsa. So I, I squeezed it. I squeezed it. I leaned on it. But that's it. And this is what I'm talking about. That's why I was so enthralled with what they did on that Vanquish, because there was no gap. So yeah, you can definitely see the light passing through on, on there. And on this side, same thing. You know, I could fit a piece of paper in there. It's not a big deal, but that's what I'm talking about. When I, when I said that Vanquish was a, a superb fit and finish, that's what I was talking about. So the wings of the fuse, they're okay. It's not terrible. It's not big enough where I can look at it and say, oh man, that's gonna be hugely draggy or cause problems, it's not. It'll be fine. The other thing on fit and finish wise was the ailerons, when I was going to center my control surfaces, it was kind of tough. Looking at the ailerons from the, from the side, it almost looks like they had washout built into that aileron. It, it's a little bit torqued there. I think you can see that. Hopefully you can see that. So the, the leading edge or the the, the wingtip, that lays down a little bit lower than at the root. You see that? A little bit of torque there in the aileron. So that's a little unfortunate, but I don't know that it'll cause any handling problems, but just a fit and finish thing to be aware of. The landing gear, I, I've read 
I've read about it. I've, I've heard some complaints about the landing gear being a little bit soft. I don't know. I, I, I think jury's out for me. Just kind of handling the plane. It does look a little floppy, but we'll see. I'm not going to make a judgment call on that, but I have read complaints about the landing gear being soft. Okay, the one area where I think I do have a little bit of a concern is this domino. So this domino can collects these two push rods for the elevator halves and joins them to a single connection going onto the servo, all right? That's plastic, and I'm just, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I, I'm, I'm not sure. We'll see. I'll be keeping a very close eye on that for, for a while until I get an idea of whether or not that's going to be a problem. So just heads up on that. Um, not sure how I feel about that. Phoenix model uses these, but they're always metal. And I've always felt pretty confident tightening down on those pretty, pretty strong and never worried about them stripping or coming loose. So not sure how I feel about that on this plane, but time will tell. I'll be keeping a very close eye on that. After I do the Maiden, that'll be one of the very first things that I take a look at. All right, one other area on fit and finish that's a little problematic is this battery hatch. Do you see the, you see the gap here along the side? It just got flex, and I really don't know why they didn't. I, I'm just going to flatten this thing out and put a le little piece of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glue some ply on the underside of this. I'm going to flatten it out, glue some ply on there, and that should pretty much take care of it. I'm, I'm not sure why they didn't do something like that, but you can see the flex. It just, I don't know. It's one of those things, kind of annoying. You know, it, it would have been nice if they would have just put something on there to, to keep that flat and, and not flex like that. Finally, on fit and finish, the horizontal stabilizer saddle was off by about three or four millimeters. It took me, it took me some work, I'm not going to lie. I, I spent some time uh, measuring and sanding and cutting and filing to get that thing flat because the idea is that you want that horizontal stabilizer to be parallel and level with the wings. And it took me a while to get that right. But when I look at it now, yeah, that looks pretty good. I still might be a millimeter off, but yeah, that, that took some work. And then the rudder wasn't perfectly 90 degrees either, so I fought with that a little bit too, getting that rudder perfectly straight. All right, now let's get into the things that I liked about this plane. The first one, and I talk about this one quite a bit, are the control horns. Well, they use the retaining plates on the top. I love that. I really, I, I'm a big fan of that. I think it's the way to go. It makes me feel a lot better when I have screws that capture a plate on the top of the control surface. I just like that a lot. And then the other thing that I like about what they did in terms of hardware is they kind of went all out. I mean, they, they brought out the big guns because hopefully you can see this, but they use these screw-on clevises, but they also have screws that go through the horn, and then they also included the fuel tubing. So they did a real nice job with the hardware on these control surfaces. I think it's one of the better arrangements. Um, I really thought about doing a Z-Bend, and I probably should have, but I don't know. I just decided to go ahead and use the 90-degree clip, and um, it, it works fine. I'm not too worried about it, but nice, nice hardware choices on Tower's part for the control horns, and that's all the way around. They're all the same. All the, both ailerons, elevator, and rudder, they're all the same. Definitely happy with that choice. All right, I mentioned in the unbox or the first look that they did not drill out the holes for the motor. So that allows us to use our motor with our radio mounts or our cross mounts and drill them out the way they fit for our motor, which I'm very happy about that. So I'm glad, I'm glad that Tower is, is not drilling the holes out. It just makes me crazy when they drill it for a rim fire and I don't use a rim fire because then I have to patch the hole and then re-drill it. It just takes time. I also like the two-part elevator. So on the back, two push rods for the elevator, one here and one here. I like that because there's no torque rod. And it takes a little bit more time to set this up, but you can, you can make sure it's perfectly right. And once it's locked in, it pretty much stays. There's no flex. Um, when you move that servo, both of, these, both of these halves move at the same time. So I'm really glad that they did the dual elevator push rods. That's, to me, that's the good way to do it. Finally, in terms of balance, I used the Book CG at 83 millimeters. And with a 4-cell 4 4000, I got some new nanotechs to go for this plane and maybe some others. But with the 4-cell 4 4000, the plane balanced perfectly, right on 
right on the book CG, no weight, no nothing. The only thing missing is the spinner up front, and I know that if I had to, I can push the battery back just a little bit to accommodate for that spinner, so I'm not worried about that. And then uh, the canopy, but the canopy sits right over the CG, so I'm, I'm certain that won't cause any problems. And then the last comment I have is the decals. Man, I probably spent more time on the darn decals than any other single thing on the plane um, because you have to put the wing decals on individually. <laughs> you, put, you put them on, you measure them out, you put them on. I spent a lot of time on those decals, but they look good. So I think it was worth the effort. They, I think they came out looking pretty sharp. Definitely worth the effort. And the tail surfaces, they've got a re real nice matching arrangement back here. I like the script and the logo on the fuselage, on the tail boom of the fuselage. I think that looks really nice. I'm real happy with the graphics arrangement on this plane. All right, those are the highlights, guys. So what I'm gonna do now is take eight or nine hours of build time or assembly time and do some voiceover work to let you know what I'm up to. If all you wanted were the highlights, you can take off now. Thanks for watching. If you like this kind of content, I appreciate your subscription. If you're new to the channel, I definitely would appreciate it if you consider subscribing. And for those of you who've been around for a while, keep doing what you're doing. You know, keep sharing, keep talking about the channel, and uh, commenting and leaving the thumbs up. That all helps. So enjoy the rest of the detail part of the build and have a good night. If you're interested in supporting the channel, I'll put a link down in the in the description and I'll put a text box in in the video. I do have t-shirts now, so if you're interested in getting a swanky new RC Video Reviews t-shirt, I've got them. All right, before I get too far into the build, there's a couple of, or, you know, assembly, because some guys like to bust your chops and say, oh, it's an R if you're not building it. Okay, fine, it's an assembly. But I'm gonna use build from now on. We're just gonna call those interchangeable words. But before I get too far into the assembly, I have to tell you that the servos that I ordered, of course, don't quite fit. And, and I, I'm not sure if it's because I misread something or if Tower is just up to their their old tricks with their non-standard servo sizes. So what I wound up doing was I made a couple of adapter plates. This adapter plate, and you can see the groove in the top there, that's meant to slide the servo in. So you put the servo in and then you slide it over and it firms it up. And I'll just screw the servo into this adapter plate. And then the adapter plate just slides into the tray where the rudder and elevator servos belong. And that's it. So that's how I solved that problem. And then I had the same exact issue, obviously, on the ailerons. So I made another, I made another adapter for the ailerons. I'll put these on Thingiverse and give you a link to those if you're interested. You can have them. These are for Emax 3003 servos. And these will probably work on more than just one tower plane, too because they do this with all their tactic servos. I've already got the covering cut out over the aileron servo pocket, so I'll just drop this in there and show you. And there we go. So one other side benefit is that you have to cut these openings, and since I already had to put this plate in in the first place, I just went ahead and added a little flange on both sides, so that covers the cut marks from the, from the shrink cover. So it looks really nice. I think it blends in really well. It looks like it was meant to be there. And then one other thing that I came up with, because there's no ventilation opening up front, and you could say, well, you know, I thought about drilling here, but when you put that prop cone on top, the spinner up front, it's really going to deflect air away from any holes you put in this firewall. Plus, I didn't want to weaken the firewall. So then the other options become getting into the top or sides. And I didn't really want to do that. So I started looking at this cover. And I thought, you know, with that cover, first off, it's just a piece of ply with a couple of bits glued on. So if I screwed it up, it'd be really easy to fix that. I could probably print 3D print another one. But here's what I came up with. I just came up with a little air scoop. And I thought about making a NACA scoop after the fact, but I'd already invested so much time in this, I just decided to run with what I got. So I just put a little air scoop together and 3D printed it. And the way that's going to work is this is the front of the battery cover. So all I have to do is just make a little slit right here. And this has got a little U channel there that, that's going to wrap around the front. So if I can get the camera to show you this the right way. So I'll set this down and then I'll push that on. 
and that just latches on the front like that. And then there's a hole right there. I'll just put a nut and a bolt through there to keep it down. And the only thing I really have to do on this piece, is you see how that, how that, there you go. You see how the air scoop sits a little proud of this leading edge of the, of the plate. All I have to do is just trim that back a little bit so this scoop sits flush with that plate and that's it. And that's the easiest, most non-invasive way. And then once I'm done with that, obviously, I have to cut out the area inside so the air has a way to go in. I'll start with that. And if that's not enough to do the job to keep things cool inside, I can always print another one and put them on the sides. One other note about this is I expanded this quite a bit until it got to the point where I started to think it looked really stupid. So I stopped right there. So hopefully that'll give me enough air to move through. We'll see, we'll see. It's a pretty good size hole. All right, so those are the 3D parts that I had to make before I even got started with the assembly. But now it's time to get on, get on with it. All right, I'm going to start out. You probably see the iron sitting there, so that's where I'm going to start. I've got a couple of wrinkles to deal with. In case you've never seen this before, I'll just, I'll just do it for you on, on camera and show you what this looks like. You just get your iron out and just touch it. You just, you don't, and be very careful of the edges. One thing I've learned is if you get close to the edges where these seams are made and you get it too hot, you will pull the covering away from the, away from the edge. And then, then you got a real problem on your hands because that's not easy to fix. So that's it, just a couple light touches. This is what I mean in the videos when I say, yeah, a couple wrinkles, nothing to write home about. That, that's why, because they, they cure that easily. It's, it's that easy to fix it. Now I've had planes, like I think it was the Tower Hobbies Chaos, man, that thing was a, that, <laughs> that thing was a saggy mess, man. That looked like a 110 year old old man. That required some real, real work with the iron. That's it, you see? Just a couple touches and it's cleaned right up. It's, it's really not that big of a deal. Now the reason I'm starting with this is because the next, the, the, the major step that I wanna take is I wanna get the decals put on before I assemble the plane. And in order to do the decals on this particular plane, these control surfaces have to be in their homes This is an elevator half. Yep, down here there's just a little. But yeah, in order to do the decals, all the control surfaces have to be on because the decals run over from the stabilizers and the wing onto the control surface. So that's why these have to be hinged and, and put in place. And once that's done, I can do the decals. I already took the material off the bottom of that, so I did that last night, just kind of a preparatory step for the assembly today. I'll tell you one thing, you really want to pay attention to this plane because the wings are symmetrical. You really want to make sure you don't glue things upside down. I mean, it'd be pretty bad if you put this aileron in backwards, you know? Fair warning there. All right, all I'm doing here is I'm using my razor knife. They, they, they always say use pins, but I, I really don't like pins because that kind of fixes you to a table surface when you're assembling. So I, I just use my knife and I put it into the slot and use the, you know, I just torque the, I just roll the blade in my hand to get them perpendicular to the surfaces. And then that also helps me keep them from getting too far into one surface or the other. So that's a little pro tip. Instead of using pins, I mean, I guess you can use pins. I guess it's okay. There we go. That looks pretty good. And then 
I noticed that they're, the ailerons are not exactly to length, so I'm not sure. I'm guessing they probably need to be out to the tip because my guess is that if you keep them too close to the fuselage, you may end up rubbing the fuselage, and we don't want that. So I'm just going to do a quick test fit and make sure. This is one of those areas where you know, just having a little bit of time under your belt helps you spot these problems before you start gluing things up. So I guess the moral of the story on this is, you know, just look ahead. Look at, always look a step ahead. That's probably the, the key. So there you go. See what I mean? If, if, I, if I were to move this all the way over, then we'd end up hitting the fuselage. So I think the right answer is for me is, is to put the aileron so it's flush with the outer wing tip out here. So that's what I'll do. Yeah, and it's going to be stubborn. So I'm not going to force it over my plane because then it'll come barreling out. I'm going to set that aside and let that one dry, and I will get started on the next one. The way I get my spacing on these is after I glue them before the glue sets up, I'll just push the, push the surface down flush against the, the wing, and then flex it. And don't let it flex beyond what it needs to do, but just flex it. And what will happen is the mechanical situation will provide the correct gap. <laughs> It'll leverage itself out to where it needs to be, but no further. So that's how I do mine uh, when it comes to gapping. I don't, I don't bother sitting there with rulers and pins and all that stuff. I just put it on there and then flex it to where it needs to be able to go in flight. And then that's it. I let it go. It's done. When I'm gluing, I push the control surface all the way flush against the wing or the stabilizer and then glue it, glue it but before it sets up and gets its grip, that's when I flex it. All right, so that's glued top and bottom. And I'll just push the aileron against the wing and then just flex it a little bit and that's it. I'm done, I'm done messing with it. Now the elevator, before putting that on, you wanna make sure that you don't have a captured back. So if you, in some planes you have to put the the elevator through a slot. In this one, you don't. The, the elevator can be pushed in from the back. So in that case, it's okay to go ahead and glue on the control surfaces. Yeah, that's another little tip if you didn't know this. If you got one side that's biting onto the hinge more than the other, then move the hinge to the side that's biting. It, it's no big deal to do that. And then you got the equipment working with you instead of against you. Because then if it's biting down hard, it'll you position it where you want it, and then when you go to insert it, it just works easier. There we go. the elevator now let's do the rudder now on the rudder you don't want to do the bottom one until everything's assembled because the bottom one was is going to wind up going into the airframe it'll go into the into the block here so just remember that one don't glue that one So if you're wondering why I'm not using the knife on all of these, on some of these, if the part's small enough, you can use the wood. So they cut slots in the wood, right? And if you put the hinge in and you put your finger over that hinge, you can press down and just use your finger to pinch, to pinch it like a plier. So I put it on a hard surface, push down over the slots where the hinge goes in. And then when I do that, the hinge doesn't move. It, it just allows the other surface to slot in there, no problem. And then I'm good to, good to go.
All right, now that all the control surfaces are glued, I'm gonna go back to the original parts and see how we did. And this is one of those things where it seems maybe counterintuitive, but when you, once you're done gluing these, you know, give them, first give them a little bit of, see, that one's loose. You give, give them a little bit of a test first. Don't just monkey fist it off. You give it a little bit of a test and see if you got something loose, and I already know I do. The reason you don't want to monkey fist it off is because if you do that, then you might take them all out, even the ones that are starting to glue. So just, just, give it a gentle little test. First, and if it's not, you just give it a gentle little test first, and if it's not glued, then you just come back and re glue it. Remember, these are wicking hinges, so you have to put some glue down. This is not, don't just put a little drop in there. You have to put some glue down on this, and the glue should wick into the hinge. And I think that's what I did wrong on the, when I glued this one, is I just didn't do enough glue. But that's okay. All right, while those parts finish up, I'm gonna install my air scoop. I basically need to go about two millimeters in. This is a two millimeter slot. There we go. So I got my air scoop on, now I just need to mark the internal area out so that I can make the hole for the air to flow. And I'm gonna drill a hole in the back for the retaining nut. All right, so the hole started. Now all I gotta do is, it's rough cut. So now I just gotta finish that off. And I'll do that with a Dremel. All right, just a little bit of Dremel work and I kind of cleaned up that edge. So now I've got a little hole underneath the scoop there. You can see my hand, there we go. So there's my hole, there's my air scoop. All I've gotta do is, is put a nut and a bolt on there and then this should just sit flush on the front of this. All right, there we go. Air scoops in. I'm just gonna bolt it on the back and we'll be done with that piece. By the way, guys, I'm gonna, for all my projects, I have this little case of nuts and bolts that I got on Amazon. There's the information off the label, but these things are invaluable to have for projects like this. If you don't have a little kit like this, I highly, highly recommend getting one. Give you an idea and attention, the attention to detail that I paid on this, on this uh, air scoop. I put a block on the top of the uh, scoop back here because I knew it was sloping. And I didn't want the screw. I knew, I knew myself well enough to know that if that screw were sitting in there cockeyed, that it would drive me absolutely crazy. So <laughs> I put a little block in there to keep it to keep it level. I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but you see, you see that little block right there, right there. Yep, I did that just to keep that screw level because without that, then the screw would have sat in the part, let me see if I can get this right. The screw would have sat in the part like that. And it would have been cockeyed when you bolted it into the bottom. So, just a little extra attention to detail. All right, there we go. Now that's on. And I've got my air scoops. I've got inbound airflow now for my electronics, which definitely makes me feel better.
All right, that's job done. Okay, I think the glue's almost done, but I'm gonna keep working. So I'm gonna do the decals. I'm gonna get started on the decals. Okay, these decals are a little unusual in that they, they have stripes and they give the dimensions on the plan for the distance for the top and the bottom from the fuselage. When you, when you put these on, I don't think they go on as a single piece. I think the idea is that they go on as individual stripes. Now nah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it the way they intended it. And we'll do the top first. Now I'm going to do the, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I can do these right off that former. Yeah, I think. Or that leading piece and that keeps the red one whole. So I think I'll do that. Okay, so what they did is they give starting and ending points for the decals on the wings. So the first one starts here, ends here. The second one starts here and ends here. And then the third one starts here and ends there. So I put a couple of red dots on the monocoat and I'll put, now that I have that done, I can line the decals up and lay them down. And because these have these strange little angles, I am gonna use water and soap. So I've got a bottle of soap and water mixed up and I've got a little credit card. So what I'll do is cut the first one out, lay it down, put some soap and water down, lay it down, and then slide it around to where I want it and then squeegee the soap and water out and then we move on to the next one. By the way, another pro tip, don't leave sharp corners on your decals. Cut them, round them. Sharp corners will come up on you. Round ones don't come up nearly as easy. There we go. All right, now I'll just use my card. Now that I've got it where I want it, I'm gonna squeegee that water out with the card. All right, that's number one. Let that dry. All right, you guys got to miss a whole lot of fun on decals. All I can say is that if you buy an uproar, you better like doing decals because there's a lot of work to do. Anyway, I'm wrapping it up and I figured I'd stop and show you one of my last little tricks. When you have a decal that crosses a seam like this, take a straight edge and put it on the flat side of the control surface. So in this case, the horizontal stabilizer, push that flat edge down, that straight edge down and then make your cut. If you do that, the razor just tends to work a lot better than if you allow the material to flex without any support there at all. And then when you've done that, you can take your straight edge and use it to push the decal down onto the 45 degree, onto the 45 degree section of the control surface. So that's what I've done in these cases. And then there we go. Now we have a nice clean edge on the straight edge of the horizontal stabilizer and the decal folds nicely into that 45 and it looks nice and clean. So that's my little technique for surfaces where I have a decal spanning a control surface gap. Okay, so horizontal stabilizer is done. The wings are done. And in this case, you have decals on top of decals. So you have the big uproar decal goes on top of the, the three ripped logos there and then you can see the fuselage has the uproar logo and i've got the vertical stabilizer done and I'd, same thing you know straight edge on the squared off 90 degree line and then push the cut piece down into the gap so that's what i did there okay now that was a lot that was a lot of decal work, guys. I mean, holy cow. I mean, 
hours. And I'm, I didn't even put everything on that I've got. I stopped. I got tired of doing it. That's that. Now we can actually start, I think we can start to actually assemble something for a chain. Take a look at the directions just to see what they recommend first. So let's just go ahead and get the wings knocked out. All right, I just had to go rifle through my stash to find some screws for the adapter plates I made and I finally got them, so. Ninety five plus seventy is one sixty five. So that's center. So Tower uses these clevises that are that have screws on the end that capture them closed. Not kinda like that. I think that's a good option very secure. They also include the fuel tubing as an option as well. The main thing I look for when I'm setting up these control horns is to make sure that the pin holes, the holes on the control horn, line up directly over the hinges on the control surface. That's the main objective because if you don't, you wind up with a differential movement and you don't want that necessarily. I mean, maybe you do. If you know what you're doing and that's what you want, then that's one way to get it. But with modern computer radios, there's no reason to do that on a mechanical basis. All right, now I got those started. <laughs> Great, it seems the the screw heads are between the smallest or the biggest jeweler screwdriver I have and the smallest Phillips that I have. That's just perfect. All right, one down, one to go. Now one thing to keep in mind about aileron servos, if you want to use both aileron servos on the same channel, you have to reverse the horns. So you don't you don't put the servo you don't put the servo gears either both on top or both on bottom. You have to have one on bottom, one on top. If you want to have them both in the same orientation, then you have to have two separate channels for ailerons. So in my case, I think just to keep things simple, I'll set up my ailerons reversed so that one's up top and one's on the bottom. Now all I'm doing here is screwing my 3D printed adapter plate down to the servo mounting brace and then once that's done, right there, now I'll take the servo screws and screw those into the servo. These servos come with rubber isolators, so may as well use them. That's all I'm putting on right now, just the rubber dampers. Dampers. Get the dampers in, I'm free to screw the servo into the mounting plate. So when these servo horn holes aren't big enough after I use my pin vise on them, then what I do next is just heat up a section of the control rod, get it good and hot and then just push it through the hole. And that way you get, now take it out right away, don't let it sit there and melt, but that way you get a nice tight fit with no slop on that horn. Once, once you just kind of cook it a little bit, melt it, then it's a perfect fit. All right, 165 is my center. I'm going to put my shrink tubing on from the front. On this particular clevis, it's just a lot easier to do it from the front. So stretch that out. Stick that over there. And now I can thread that onto the control rod. I like to thread mine about halfway on. 
Uh, and what I, mean, what I mean by that is I want the clevis to go about halfway the distance of the thread. And that way it gives me room to adjust either in or out as the case may be on any given clevis. The main thing is just give yourself some room to adjust. You don't want to start too close or too, you know, don't want to screw it in too far and you don't want it too loose either. You just need a little bit of room. So all I'm doing now is I'm going to hook my clevis up to the control horn and that way I can use the control rod as a guide on where the control horn gets screwed into the wing. So I, I'll, now that I've got that on there, this becomes my indicator. So I'll set the control horn down on the, on the aileron and I can position it, get my pins or my holes over the hinge line. And now I can make sure my control rod is nice and parallel with the servo. And my holes are directly over that hinge line. And I'll take a pin vise and just make some guide holes for the screws. And then we can drive the screws in. That's two, that looks good. The ailerons are done, so the wings are done. Now it's the tail feathers, so let's put the wings on and then get the tail feathers arranged correctly. So you wanna put the wings on for this step because in order to get the tail feathers right, you have to measure and make sure that your tail feather horizontal stabilizer and vertical stabilizer are true. You don't. This is one of the, this is probably one of the more critical aspects of putting an ARF together, and that's making sure that your geometry is true. If you, if you mess this part up, then the plane will never fly right. It, it just never, it'll never fly right. You'll have problems in loops, you'll have yaw issues. All right, the horizontal stabilizer is keyed, so you see that hole right there? That lines up with the vertical stabilizer right there. So that helps keeping this centered, but it doesn't help with the left and right angles. So once this is in, you still, it's a good idea to put the vertical stabilizer in, but you still need to measure from tip to wing tip and tip to wing tip. And you also need to check for level. You can't, you don't want to skip that. You got to make sure that this saddle is even on both sides. So you want the horizontal really this is really important stuff you got to make sure that horizontal stabilizer is completely flat now that's interesting you're supposed to put that you're supposed to put the the glue hinge in it's not cut that's the first thing so you got to cut it the, the hinges the slots there but Somehow you have to get this and put to get, all right, I'm going to wait until I'm done measuring before I even bother fiddling with that. Okay. So now I've got the tail feathers roughed in. Now it's time to take some measurements. And again, this is an area you measure, I measure a lot because if you get this wrong, the geometry, the geometry of the plane is wrong and it will never fly right after that. So this is one of those areas where it's just best to take your time.
And we're just screwing on the elevator clevis for one side of the elevator. All right, that's one down, one to go. Okay, time to put the last servos in. And again, I made a uh, adapter plate and there's a center section that allows the servo to drop in and then you can see this, this side, it's, it comes down a little bit lower and that stops the four and a half slop on the servo. So I'm just gonna get my servos set up in here real quick and then we'll drop them in and get the elevator and rudder connected. So that little slot in there just gives me a little bit of extra room to get the servo in. And then once it's in, I slide it down and there's no more four and a half slop in there. Kind of a cool little system. Patented by RC Video Reviews. No, I'm just kidding. That'll be on Thingiverse if you guys need a servo tray. I don't really think, strictly speaking, for electric that this is necessary. Because I think once you have a well-balanced prop up front that these dampeners just th these dampers just aren't really required i think this is more of a leftover from the gas days or the nitro days when they no matter how <laughs> how balanced you were that plane vibrated but since they have them why not use them to me, it kind of looks more complete that way, I think, you know? And so you guys know when I put these in, I put the ring down on the bottom. Can you see that ring there? I put that on the bottom, and then the screw between the ring and the screw, that makes a nice sandwich for that.